This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. If you drive from Oakland to Los Angeles in February, you'll pass through a spectacular scene. Neat, symmetrical rows of trees covered with pink and white flowers stretching on for hundreds of miles. This is the annual California almond bloom, and it really is massive. California almond trees take up a million acres of land in the Central Valley. When the petals fall off, they carpet the road and create this sweet smell. And the almond bloom also has its own distinctive sound. You can actually hear it before you even walk into the orchard. That's the sound of thousands of bees from an orchard outside of Modesto, California. To create a single almond, a blossom needs as many as a dozen bee visits. That means you need roughly 80,000 bees to pollinate an acre of almonds. That's Adam Allington. He's a reporter covering the environment for Bloomberg. He also hosts the podcast, The Business of Bees. When you think of bees in business, you're probably thinking of honey. But in fact, honey has little to do with commercial beekeeping today. Every winter, beekeepers from every corner of the United States descend on California to pollinate almonds. Almonds have a window of about two weeks for pollination to occur. Otherwise, the blossoms won't turn into fruit. The demand is so high, it takes almost every beehive in the country to do the job. Upwards of two million hives. This is the largest managed pollination event on Earth. This is John Miller. He's a fourth-generation beekeeper from North Dakota. And every year, John brings 13,000 hives over 1,500 miles to the Central Valley. I've got the best job on Earth. Look at this. It's a beautiful spring day in Northern California. Almond trees are in bloom. I just love it. What are we looking at right here? This is the top of the hive. These are the occupants. These are the little bees. They're hanging out. There's a, there's, well, this guy just landed. For a beekeeper like John, pollination isn't just big business, it's most of his business. In recent years, almond pollination has become so lucrative, it accounts for about two-thirds of John's income. How much of this honey actually will go to making honey for people to eat? None. Instead of selling the honey, John says it's more cost-effective to just leave it in the hive as food for the bees. After pollinating almonds, John will load his bees onto a semi-truck and they'll move from one crop to another in other states. You know, they'll go from almonds to plums to cherries to apples to vine crops to pit fruits to cotton to lima beans to watermelons and then their season is over. Farmers have known for centuries that putting a hive of honeybees in an orchard results in more blossoms becoming cherries, almonds, or apples. But it's only in the last 30 years that pollination services like the kind that John provides have become such an enormous part of American agriculture. Today, bees have become more livestock than wild creatures, basically tiny little winged cows that depend on humans for shelter, food, and even medicine. But for thousands of years, our relationship with bees was much simpler. It was really all about the honey. Way before sugar came along, honey was one of the few sweeteners we had. There are 8,000-year-old cave paintings in Spain of people collecting wild honey. And once humans got a taste for honey, they'd do almost anything to get it. Alexander Zomchek is an apiculturist at the University of Miami, Ohio. He studies bees and agriculture. To put it gently we found ourselves as plunderers uh, when we tripped across uh, natural beehives, the Winnie the Pooh trees in the wild. And when people came across one of these trees, they would cut it down. And in so doing, rob the bees of this honey. It was not a a, a wonderful experience. Um, We didn't have bee suits. We weren't, it was a, a a pretty raw event. These collectors would smother and kill the bees with smoke, and then they'd take the honey. It was not exactly a sustainable process. Slowly over time, it really dawned on us that, well, what if we tried to put them in a container? By the Middle Ages, beekeepers in Europe had designed a method of capturing swarms of bees and then putting them inside woven upside-down baskets called skeps. For all you vexillologists out there, there's actually a bee skep on the state flag of Utah. It's got a little door for the bees to come in and out, and it's positioned right in the center between the words Utah and industry. An obvious advantage of the skep design was that you didn't have to go out and hunt for the honey and chop down a tree to get it. And the skeps were portable. 
When the first Europeans came to America, they brought along a few skeps full of honeybees, which are actually not native to North America. The species the Europeans brought over is called Apis mellifera. It's Latin for honey carrier. Of the 20,000 bee species in the world, Apis mellifera is the only one that can produce enough honey to be useful for humans. It formed larger colonies. It had a gentle nature. Um, it was a good honey producer. It was one that we could use around the world, and that was our golden retriever. And these docile, sweet-tempered bees did really well in America. There's a good saying by a 17th century scholar that said the honeybees did better than the settlers did. That's Tammy Horn Potter. I am the Kentucky State Apiarist. I work with the Kentucky Department of Agriculture. Tammy also wrote a book titled Bees in America, How the Honeybee Shaped a Nation. And she says the honeybees loved their new continent. There were plenty of stands of a type of a species of tree called black gum. And black gum trees are notable because they decay from the inside out very quickly. They would swarm and take up residence in these trees. And so honeybees did very well. So by the middle of the 19th century, honeybees were well-established in North America. People were still keeping them in skeps or hunting small amounts of wild honey in nature. But eventually everything changed with a Presbyterian minister named Lorenzo Langstroth. After attending seminary at Yale, Langstroth returned to his hometown of Philadelphia in 1848. And during this time, Langstroth began to struggle with mental illness. In diaries from the time, his family referred to it as head troubles. Today, it's what we'd call seasonal affective disorder. Back then, a standard prescription to fight depression would be laudanum. That's an alcoholic solution containing morphine. But Langstroth's doctor wanted to try something more gentle. He told him to spend more time outdoors, which he did. He would take long walks on his own out in nature, and he developed an extreme fascination with wild honeybees. He literally just spent hours and days and weeks and months staring at these hollow bee trees until an idea finally clicked in his mind. Langstroth noticed something about beehives in the wild. There was this pattern, a kind of mathematical precision to the spacing between the honeycombs. And the moment came when he realized there is this same, same exact space, a carpenter's number, three-eighths of an inch, between every one of these combs. And they were measured again and again, different hives, different times, different colonies. And it's always three-eighths of an inch. Langstroth called this area the bee space. Three-eighths of an inch is the exact amount of space bees need to move around a colony. They're like little hallways between the honeycombs. So then Langstroth took this idea of the bee space and he put it in a box. Inside each wooden hive box, he would hang a series of removable frames, kind of like empty picture frames. And each one was spaced three-eighths of an inch apart. When Langstroth put bees inside the box, they looked up at the frames and they thought, hey, you know what? This looks a lot like home. Then other bees joined in, and before you know it, they were making colonies inside these boxes. And the Langstroth hive was invented. It's the modern beehive, the one that we still have today. It was the first artificial hive which could be easily controlled and moved around. It changed everything about beekeeping. Oh, it was fundamental. I mean, there's just no doubt about that. Because once beekeepers can manage colonies, they can check on their health. Say if it's a, if it's a drought, they can help provide supplemental food. Langstroth's innovations meant people could keep more bees, and the bees could reuse their honeycombs because people weren't destroying them all the time, which allowed honey production to go way up. Langstroth published a book of his findings in 1853 called The Hive and the Honey Bee. It's still widely read in beekeeping circles today, and once it got out, beekeeping became big business all over the world. The hives are crammed with honey and ready for man to rob. The bees have made millions of journeys to add to that precious store. To be or not to be, to be it is. After World War I, people kept innovating and honey production went from family farming to a giant commercial operation. By the end of World War II, there were something like 5.9 million commercial beehives in the United States. It also set the stage for the next chapter of beekeeping 
the rise of commercial pollination. In the 1950s, small family farms started getting pushed out by big companies and industrial agriculture. While family farms had fields with different crops growing side by side, the new model replaced the whole system with ever-expanding fields devoted to growing just one plant. Instead of planting cover crops to replenish the soil after the harvest, they just use fertilizer. Some of our commercial crops, like corn, rice, and wheat, are pollinated by the wind. But many of our fruits and vegetables rely on insects to do the job. As the entire business became more and more industrialized and shifted to monoculture, there was a need for greater certainty when it came to pollination. Commercial bees, thanks to the Langstroth hive, were a perfect fit. Controlled by humans and highly portable, they were able to do more pollinating in a day than most wild insects do in a week. So instead of trusting the local ecosystem to pollinate their crops, many farms came to depend on this single domesticated species of bee. As farmers grew more crops, commercial beekeepers started earning more money by renting out their bees as pollinators. But while pollination is big business in the United States, actually, the U.S. is pretty much the only country that does this. Jeff Lee is a commercial beekeeper from North Carolina. Every year, he ships 1,200 hives to California to pollinate almonds. In March, they'll come back to North Carolina, where I will do high bush blueberry pollination. After that, they will go up to Maine. That's where they'll do the low bush blueberry pollination. And some will go to Wisconsin for cranberry pollination. And others will come right back to North Carolina for a cucumber and watermelon pollination. Today, commercial beekeepers get most of their income from pollination. They're paid around $200 per hive for a few weeks of pollinating almonds. So if you do the math, $200 per hive times, say, 1,000 hives, that's $200,000, which sounds like pretty good money for three weeks of work. But Lee says the cost for keeping bees alive has shot through the roof in the last couple years. Right now, beekeepers are facing one big challenge. You might already know about it if you watched the worst movie of 2008, The Happening, starring Mark Wahlberg as a beleaguered science teacher. I don't know if any of you guys have heard about this article in the New York Times. Well, apparently, honeybees are just disappearing all over the country. Tens of millions of them. All right, let's hear some theories about why this might be happening. Nobody? You're not interested in what happened to the bees? Tragically, I have seen The Happening. Marky Mark is not good in this movie. But he's right. The bees are dying. Adult bees leave the hive and never come back, leaving the babies to die. Researchers blame pesticides, disease, and parasites. Back in 2007, reports of a mysterious bee plague called Colony Collapse Disorder were making headlines all over the country. And it got people worried. There were articles warning us about the end of bees. There were studies by freaked out scientists. Colony collapse is when all the bees in a colony just disappear in the course of a few days. There's no bee corpses to do an autopsy on and no obvious signs of poisoning. Around 2007, it was happening a lot. The number of cases technically labeled as colony collapse has actually gone down since then. But Jeff Lee says it's still happening. Bees disappearing or dying in huge numbers. This last year, I had the most losses I have ever had. And I'm reading the literature and I'm trying to do everything I can to keep the bees healthy. A recent survey of commercial beekeepers found the average yearly die-off rate is about 40 percent, which is way higher than the 10 to 15 percent, which used to be normal. Researchers point to increased use of pesticides as one factor. And when the bees started dying, there were protests. Save the bees! Are we it's give bees a chance. No more poison! You're not just killing the bees, you're killing yourself! But pesticides aren't the only culprit. Another problem is an invasive parasitic mite from Asia called Varroa destructor. Once it has penetrated the beehive, the varroa mite multiplies in the brood cells where the queen has laid her eggs. They use their mouth parts to suck a blood-like fluid from the bee larvae and then lay their eggs in the brood cell. This is a video from 2017. 
It's made by Bayer, the largest producer of pesticides in the world. And given that, of course, Bayer wants us to focus on the mites. By the time the bee hatches, it is weakened, often infected with viruses, and has a shortened lifespan. The varroa mite can also be carried by the bee into other beehives. Varroa mites have wiped out tens of millions of beehives in the United States. Since the European honeybee didn't evolve alongside the mite, the bees don't have a natural defense. And because most of the commercial beehives in the country end up in a single place in California every February, we've created the ideal scenario for varroa mites to spread from one hive to another. Which is a real threat to our food supply, because our whole agricultural system has become dependent on this single, vulnerable species of insect. And now it's hard to imagine feeding the country without them. It's inextricable from industrial ag which the United States excels in, not just excels, it defines industrial ag. You know, that's at the root of all of our ability to have monocultural orchards. You know, your pumpkins and your raspberries and, and blueberries and blackberries, you know, you don't, you don't get those uh, massive tracts of production without pollination. But there are farmers today who are trying to rely less on honeybee livestock by reintroducing wild bees and insects into the pollination landscape. According to entomologists, just a small amount of plant diversity can help boost the population of wild bees and other pollinators like butterflies and beetles. An example of this is something called a pollinator hedgerow, basically a small strip of native weeds or flowers near the edge of a field that can provide habitat and food for wild insects and bees all year round. The history of agriculture has been a history of control, trying to bend nature to our will and make it predictable and productive. But for the sake of the bees, and maybe even for the future of our food supply, we might need an agricultural system that's just a little bit more wild. More with Adam about how domesticated bees became a symbol of conservation. After this. So in the story, you mentioned that Save the Bees has become a big part of the conservation movement in the last couple of years. And when I was a kid, it was all, you know, whales and pandas and other charismatic megafauna. And How did bees take off as both a focus of activism and as a symbol? Well, I think it really started around 2006 with the, you know, with the onset of the colony collapse disorder scare. Honeybees really became this symbol of confluence of all these environmental problems. And they had the advantage of being cute and cuddly Mm -hmm. and easily identifiable creatures, you know. So environmentalists really latched on to them. And in some cases, some states actually sued to create protections for honeybees. Uh, You know, you probably heard the protests. There was actually a really huge protest in the UK a few years back where protesters dressed up like Winnie the Pooh were holding signs and, you know, singing songs. And basically, we are all beekeepers. (laughs) Winnie the Pooh wasn't the greatest beekeeper. (laughs) <laughs> no, and in fact, the yeah, you know, most of those hives that Winnie the Pooh was actually robbing were paper wasps, which right. don't actually produce honey. But uh, <laughs> so when you talk to most people about saving the bees, the image that they probably have in their head is like of an orange and black honeybee. Right. And this is the result of all of this promotion and cartoon bees like the Honey Nut Cheerios bee. <laughs> yeah. One person I spoke with for this series, Catherine Baldock, she's a biologist in the UK. And she says the big reason people care about bees and conservation is the honeybee. They're kind of like the panda, aren't they, of um, invertebrate conservation. I think it is a good thing by conserving uh, or by trying to help bees. We're generally improving habitats, putting more flowers in, and that's going to benefit a whole host of other kind of species. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing. They're they're kind of like a bit of a symbol of of conservation in a way, aren't they? The panda of bees are struggling. In fact, we're losing about 40% per year, but they aren't an extinction risk. You know, they're managed just like cows or sheep. So Mm -hmm. they'll probably be okay 
it's really the native bees that we're worried about. And the key distinction here is that things that benefit honeybees don't always benefit native bees, especially when the two species are competing for the same resources, you know? So actually, this has kind of become a problem in recent years. Uh, Beekeepers have lobbied the federal government to be allowed to put their honeybee hives into national parks, where the bees then can outcompete native bees for the floral resources. So that's a case where you have this managed species, a honeybee, outcompeting with a native species. Wow. So honeybees might not be a great symbol for conservation after all. So what species would be more accurate if you wanted to have an invertebrate mascot for environmentalists? Well, there's no shortage of candidates, that's for sure. You know, mm-hmm. about 20,000 bee species in the world. But, you know, uh, let's run through just a couple that spring to the top of your mind. The black sweat bee, you know, this is kind of like the Ozzy Osbourne of bees, you know, <laughs> all black, kind of looks more like a fly with these kind of purple eyes. Yeah. You know, you've got ground nesting bees like the mason bees, which are, you know, kind of resemble honeybees, a little more shaggy, a little more rough around the edges. <laughs> And then the rusty-patched bumblebee, which was actually recently added to the endangered species list, it's actually quite cute and cuddly. You know, it looks like a bumblebee, except it's got these two little rust-colored orange patches on its back. That would be a bee that could compete, you know, on cuteness (laughs) alone. Other than finding the perfect fuzzy symbol for conservation when it comes to bees... If people are concerned about bees and the health of bee populations, what can they do? Well, you know, this is where there's a bit of good news because unlike other big looming environmental issues, which can kind of be abstract or maybe difficult to wrap your head around in terms of individual action, you know, things like climate change, for instance, Mm -hmm. with pollinators, you can actually do something that will create direct benefit for bees. Mm -hmm. Um, This doesn't include, you know, unfortunately, buying things like local honey from the farmer's market. And don't get me wrong, I love honey, but it doesn't actually help native bees if we're purchasing a product that's created by honeybees. The same thing goes with backyard beekeeping. It doesn't do anything to help pollinators by raising basically this agricultural livestock. You know, so toward that end, there are things you can do, which is obviously plant more native flowers and plants in your yard. Mm -hmm. Plants that can bloom at different times throughout the year to give those bees something to feed on. Other things, obviously, like avoiding pesticides, for example, you know, or perhaps consider letting your lawn go a bit wild, letting all those dandelions come up in the springtime. Those are things that can really help native pollinators quite a bit. I'm so excited about this because I hate taking care of the lawn and letting it go wild is exactly in keeping with both my (laughs) ethic as a conservationist and as a lazy human. That seems perfect for me. There you go. Now you've got an explanation. (laughs) Because the neighbors get mad and I can just say I'm doing it for the bees. Exactly. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, Roman. If you'd like to hear more about the connections between honeybees and our environmental landscape, you should check out Adam's show. It's called The Business of Bees. It's available everywhere you get your podcasts. 99% Invisible was produced this week by Adam Allington, edited by Chris Barube, mix and tech production by Sharif Youssef, music by Sean Rial. Katie Mingle is our senior producer. Kurt Kolstad is the digital director. The rest of the team is Emmett Fitzgerald, Avery Truffleman, Joe Rosenberg, Vivian Lee, Delaney Hall, Sophia Klatsker, and me, Roman Mars. We are a project of 91.7 KALW in San Francisco and produced on Radio Row in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. 99% Invisible is a member of Radiotopia from PRX, a fiercely independent collective of the most innovative shows in all of podcasting. Find them all at radiotopia.fm. You can find the show and join discussions about the show on Facebook. You can tweet at me at Roman Mars and the show at 99PI.org. We're on Instagram and Reddit too. But you're always welcome to hang out at our hive at 99PI.org. Radiotopia.